Hey guys, we're solving 9702, May June 2022, paper 1 1 today. So, this is the beginning of the May June 2022 series. I'm going to be solving paper 1, paper 2, paper 4, as well as paper 5. So, keep your eyes on the channel if you're interested for it. So, let's begin. A lot of you have been requesting this, by the way. Uh, Physics paper 1, major 2022. So let's see. Let's begin. The data booklet has changed from 2022, by the way, but this mostly applies to um, A2, right? Not AS. Also, if you guys want to look at the threshold, this is how it stands. Wait up. For paper 1 1, you guys know the maximum mark. It's, it was at 40. So A was at 25. B was at 21. C was at 17. D was at 14. And E was at 11. Right? So A star was probably at around 30, 30 to 32, approximately. Let's begin, starting with question number one. Which term represents a physical quantity? Quantity is something with the value as well as a unit. Okay. So meter is not a physical quantity because it is merely a unit. Percentage uncertainty. Uh, this is neither a unit nor a quantity. Quark flavor, strange bottom top. This is neither a unit nor a quantity. But spring constant K. K is in fact a physical quantity. Because it can have a value. You know that f is equal to Kx. So k is equal to f by x, right? So it is a physical quantity because it has a value as well as a unit, which is a newton per meter. So yeah, we're going to go with d. Number two, which two units are identical when expressed in terms of base units? Okay. Joule per coulomb. You know the coulomb is q is equal to it, right? Joules per coulomb joules and q is equal to it so ampere second joules is kg meter square s minus 2 kg m s minus 2 multiplied by meter divided by ampere second that is actually kilograms meter square ampere minus 1 second minus 3 kilogram meter square ampere minus 1 second it should have been minus 3 now let's go to b b is joule second kg m square is minus 2 times second so that's kg m square is minus 1 kg m square is minus 1 I'm gonna go with B 3 a value for the acceleration of free fall on earth is given as 10 plus minus 2 which statement is correct so 9.81 is the accurate and precise answer 10 is close to 9.81 so we can say that our value is accurate right our value is in fact accurate but it's not precise to two decimal places, so A is the best answer. Precision depends on the number of significant figures, okay, we're using. It depends on the instrument we used. Four, two cables are attached to a bracket and exert forces as shown. What are the components of the horizontal and vertical components of the resultant? What are the magnitudes of the horizontal and vertical components of the resultant of the two forces? Okay, so the horizontal resultant force is 15 cos 20 plus 6 sine 40 so 15 cos 20 plus 6 sine 40 that gives us a value of 17.95 what about vertical it's 15 sine 20 here and 60 cos 40 down there so 15 sine 20 minus 6 cos 40 gives me a value of um, you know 15 sine 20 minus 60 cos 40 gives us a value of 0.534 newtons upwards so 0.534 up okay 
17.534 up and 17.95 or 18 to the right so 4 should be C 5 the curve line PQR is the velocity time graph for a car starting from rest where is the average acceleration of the car over the first 5 seconds so remember acceleration is the gradient of the velocity time curve okay it's the gradient so it can't be the area now what about C and D what is average acceleration by the way average acceleration is total change in velocity divided by total time taken right so the gradient of the tangent at Q won't give us the average acceleration it will give us the acceleration at Q if we want the average acceleration we want a relationship between P and Q okay so it will be the total change of P and Q in velocity divided by the time taken so yeah we should connect those lines and then uh, find out the gradient of that line that should give us an accurate representation okay so 5 is C right 6 a ball is thrown horizontally with a speed of 10 above horizontal ground so above horizontal ground the ball is hit with a speed of 10 meter per second this is horizontal projectile actually the ball hits the ground after times 3 second where is the speed of the ball just before hitting the ground interesting this speed actually refers to both the vertical and horizontal component so let's find out the uh, you know let's find out the vertical speed right so initially the vertical speed component of velocity is zero so if you want to find out the vertical final vertical speed we're going to use v is equal to u plus at so final vertical speed equals to zero plus 9.81 times 3 so 9.81 times 3 is 29.43 so the ball is hitting the ground with a vertical component and horizontal component vertical component of 29.43 and horizontal component of 10 it remains constant so if we want to find out the resulting one we're gonna we're gonna apply Pythagoras theorem so 29.43 whole square plus 10 square okay so square plus 10 square root over answer gives us a value of 31 I'm gonna go with 6c okay an object is moving along the ground in a straight line at constant speed which statement of the resultant force is uh, correct so moving at constant speed or when you are stationary means only one thing that the net force is zero that, that is it we can't say that the resultant force acting on the object is equal to the weight how are you sure that the resultant force <sighs> that doesn't make sense that doesn't make sense <clears throat> the resultant force acting on the body is equal to the product of its mass and velocity it doesn't make any sense if you see constant speed or stationary that means that the resultant force is zero eight water flows out of a pipe and hits the wall this is a common mcq when the jet of water hits the wall it has horizontal velocity v and cross-section area a the density of water is rho the water does not rebound from the wall what is the force exerted on the wall by the water essentially what we want to do here is just match the units that's it we have to match the units here so for this rho v by a we know that the unit of force is kg ms minus 2 right this is f so here rho is kg m minus 3 times velocity meter per second by area meter square what do we end up with kg m minus 2 s minus 1 m minus 2 or kg m minus 4 s minus 1 this isn't cutting it b kg m minus 3 meter square s minus 2 meter minus 2 we can get rid of these kg m minus 3 s minus 2 it's still not working what about c kg m minus 3 meter square meter per second so kg we can get rid of all this kg second minus 1 this isn't working what about d for d it's kg meter minus 3 times meter square times meter per second so we end up with kg meter per second square right so kg meter per cube uh, meter square times meter square second minus 2 so in total we end up with kg meter second to the power minus 2 kg ms minus 2 so 
if you want to look at the unit for force f is equal to ma which is kg ms minus 2 okay did I write kg meter square it's minus 2 before it's kg ms minus 2 it should match with this so only d matches with that so yeah uh, d is our answer uh, 9. A projectile is launched at an angle above horizontal ground and travels through air. The projectile reaches its maximum height as posed in x, position x, assume that no upthrust acts on the projectile. Which diagram shows the duration of the force or forces acting on the projectile at position x? Listen guys, only weight acts on position x as there is no resistive force, right? Did they say that there is any resistive force? Okay, so they might not say directly but you have to infer it from the question they have told us that it travels through air so air means that it will face a resistance it can't be d because weight is acting downwards only okay so we need a downward force it's between a and b it's not d because uh, you know weight can't act upwards it only acts downwards so weight is acting downwards over here also since it's traveling through air and it's traveling rightward uh, air resistance will oppose its motion towards the left right that is why uh, the correct answer should be b 9 is in fact b okay, typically you will <coughs> assume that air resistance is negligible they will mention that in the question 10 what is the statement of the principle of conservation of momentum it states that net momentum is conserved before before and after collision given that uh, no resultant force acts on the system so a force is equal to the rate of change of momentum this is not the law this is Newton's second law. In a perfectly elastic collision, the relative momentum of the objects before impact is equal to the relative momentum after. No. It is applicable for all types of collisions, elastic and elastic. The momentum of an object is the product of the mass. This is not the law. The total momentum of a system remains constant, providing that no resultant external force acts on it. D looks perfect. All right, that's great, guys. Moving on to 11. So for 11, a horizontal wooden plank is pivoted at one end, as shown. The plank has a mass of 100 kg and a length of 10 meters. The center of gravity of the plank is a distance of 4 meters from the pivot. What is the moment of the weight of the plank about the pivot? Okay. So this is center of gravity. The weight will act through the center of gravity. It has a mass of 100 kg. Okay. So moment is basically the force into the perpendicular distance. So we need to take... 4 actually so that's 4 meters into the weight that means 10 into 9.81 100 into 9.81 mass into gravity 100 times 9.81 times 4 that is 3924 what is the closest answer to 3924 uh, it's 4000 so we're gonna go with C 11 is C till now the variant seems very easy it's, it seems too easy actually when must an object be in equilibrium net force and net torque must be equal to zero i always tell this to my students when no resultant force and no resultant torque acts on the object so 12 needs to be b these are the conditions okay 13 okay this is a common mcq it repeats from time to time a uh, uniform diving board is held by two fixed rods at point P and Q. A person stands at the end art of the diving board as shown. The force exerted by the rods on the board are vertical. The board remains in equilibrium and the person slowly moves towards point Q from end R, which show describes the changes in magnitudes of the forces exerted by the rods on the board. Okay. Let's figure this out. So logically, what if I consider Q to be the pivot, okay? Then... P is providing a an anti-clockwise moment and R is providing, the man at R is providing a clockwise moment. So they were equal at one point. Now what happened, listen to me, the man starts moving towards the pivot Q. So if the man moves closer, what happens to the net clockwise moment? Since he came closer to the pivot, the clockwise moment actually decreases. So to balance things, since it remains in equilibrium, to balance it, the anti-clockwise moment must also decrease. So the force at P must decrease. The force at P must decrease, okay? Now, hear me out. Since the force at P decreases, the weight remains the same, right? Suppose the weight was uh, 50 Newton, for example, but uh, the distance reduced, right? So the moment reduced, but the distance for P 
distance from the pivot for p remain the same. So how did we reduce at the moment the anti-clockwise moment by reducing the value of p? So suppose the value of p was 40 initially, but now it decreased to 30. So beforehand, what was the net downward force? It was 40 plus 50. Since it was in equilibrium, Q provided an upward force that balanced this. But now, since the force decreased to 30 plus 50, Q now provides a force of 80 newtons to balance it. So what happened to the force? It also decreased. 13 is A. Interesting sum. Next. Fourteen. A solid block has sides of length L, 2L and 4L. The block is submerged in water of uniform density so that the faces with the largest area are horizontal. The upthrust acting on the block is U. Okay. The block is now rotated to a new position so that the faces with the smallest area are horizontal. The block remains fully submerged in the water. Okay. So remember, the formula for upthrust is in fact V rho G. So it doesn't really matter how our uh, block is placed, the upthrust will remain the same because it actually depends on the volume rather than the area, the upthrust, do you understand? So even if the block was like this, you know, it would still be the same upthrust, okay? 15. In a large container in an oil refinery, three oils of different densities are mixed. No chemical activity occurs. The mixture consists of these. What is the density of the mixture? Okay. So this is how it's done. The total mass is 5,500. 6700 so 1200 by 6700 times 1100 plus 1500 by 6700 times 860 plus 4000 by 6700 times 910 try adding this up It gives me a value of 932.8 or 933 basically. So 15 910. Wait, let me check again. 1200 plus 1500 plus 4000. 6700. One thousand one hundred plus fifteen hundred by six thousand seven hundred times eight sixty plus four thousand by six thousand seven hundred times nine hundred ten gives us a value of nine thirty three. I'm getting 93 as my answer, but the mark scheme says it's A. Interesting. Let me check. I think this is a repeat question. Okay, for Fifteen. Okay, so for fifteen, this is a common question. Uh, I, I, this is from O nineteen one one. You'll find the same question there. How do we do this? Do you guys know that density is equal to mass by volume, right? So we just need to find out the total volume because the total mass is added up to get six thousand seven hundred kg, and the total volume should actually be. You know that density equals to mass by volume, volume equals to mass by density. So for this one, it should be 1200 zero zero by 1100. Zero zero. This one is 1500 zero zero by 860. And the last one is 4000 by 910. So this is the total volume. So if you want to find out the density for good, density equals to mass 6700 divided by, you know, 
1500 by 860 plus 1200 by 1100 plus 4000 by 910. Do it. Twelve hundred by one thousand one hundred by plus fifteen hundred by eight sixty plus four thousand by nine hundred sixty nine hundred ten sorry that's the total volume it's uh, six seven zero zero by seven point two three meter cubes so six thousand seven hundred total mass divided by total volume gives us a value of nine hundred twenty seven. So we're going to go with A. A is the correct answer. Okay. 16. A box slides down a rough ramp. The change in GP is 16 as it moves from, it moves between positions X and Y. The box has 24 joules of kinetic energy at X and 35 joules of kinetic energy at Y. How much work is done against the frictional force? Okay. So the change in GP is 16 joules. So initially we had GP Initially, we had GP and we had some KE of 24. At the end, we had KE of 35. So, this remember, these are the initial energies, and on the fine, this is initial. On the final energy side, we have some KE of 35 and some work done against resistance, which is unknown as X. So, X plus 35 is equal to 40 x is equal to 40 minus 35 which is 5. 5 joules of work is done against resistance actually 16a. 17. The total useful supply energy supplied to an electric motor is E. Energy Q is wasted and the remaining energy does useful work. What is efficiency of the motor? Okay. So efficiency is useful by total energy. So basically total energy supplied is E. It can't be A because A is wasted by total, so that doesn't make sense. But if you do subtract the wasted by total energy from 1, you're actually going to get the useful energy by total energy. Because check this out, wasted by total plus useful by total is equal to 1. Because if you do the LCM, Q plus U by E is equal to 1, or Q plus U is equal to E, right? That is how we got this, so it's actually C, 17 C. 18. Objects with different masses are placed on the horizontal surface of a table. The objects are then raised to different heights above the table. The gain in gravitational potential energy of each object is the same. Which graph shows the variation of the height of the object above the table with their mass M? So you know that GP is actually MGH, right? So how is the relationship actually? Let's see. Objects with different masses are placed on a horizontal surface of a table. The objects are then raised to different heights above the table. The gain in GPE of each object is the same. So this is the table objects with different masses are placed here then they are raised to different heights above the table the gain in gp of each object is the same okay so the gain in gp is same even though the heights are different do you guys understand so for example if we move this to a height of you know five meters for example we can move this to a height of 10 meters for example and we can move this to a height of, you know, maybe uh, one meter, for example. Okay. But they all have the same GP. How is that possible? They have different masses. You see? So, for example, what if the object that was moved to 10 meters had a mass of 1 kg? Then the object moved to 5 meters needed to have a mass of 2 kg. And the object moved to 1 meter need, needed to have a mass of 10 kg. Clear? 10 times 1 is 10. Also, 10 times 1 is 10, and 2 times 5 is 10. What does that mean? Objects which have high height, something like 10, will have a mass of 1 kg. Then, objects with a height of 5 meter will have a mass of, you know, 2 kg. And objects with a height of 1 meter will have a mass of 10 kg. Hopefully that makes sense. This is the only one which makes sense because in the other ones, 
height of 1 meter mass of 1 kg it doesn't make sense height of 3 meters mass of height of 5 meters mass of 5 kg it doesn't make sense it shows us a proportional relationship it shouldn't be proportional it shouldn't be horizontal it shouldn't be exponential either because suppose height of 1 meter mass of 1 kg then this is height of 5 meters height of you know uh, mass of 5 or 10 kg maybe that doesn't make sense you know it's it can't be a proportional relationship it has to be inversely proportional for the gp to be the same tricky question 19 two wires p and q are made from the same material okay same young modulus wire q has half the length and twice the diameter okay so e is equal to f l by a e let's do the original one for a p okay so for p the extension of p is F L by A E and extension for Q is or basically this is uh, F L by pi D square by 4 pi D square by 4 capital E that's the area but it has Y Q is half the length but twice the diameter okay so this is the original one you know this is the original one extension for p goes like this extension of p is 4 fl by pi d square e this is what happened originally now what what about q for q the length is actually halved half the length but twice the diameter so pi 2d by 2 whole square you know the formula for area is pi d square by 4 right how because uh, radius is actually diameter by 2 so pi d by 2 whole square gives us pi d square by 4 but now since diameter is doubled it's going to be pi 2d by 2 whole square we can get rid of the 2's and uh, we end up with e over here so if you find out the final answer it's actually fl by 2 pi d square e so let's compare them this part is constant Right, if L by pi d square is constant, so if you go for E P by E Q, you're actually gonna end up with four divided by half, which is actually eight times. So this is actually eight times the original one. So nineteen is in fact a. Which statement about elastic and plastic deformation must be correct? Elastic deformation plastic are proportional to the no. Elastic deformation plastic cause no change in volume. No. Elastic deformation is reversible, plastic is not. D is the correct answer. C is not right because elastic deformation causes heating, but plastic does not. This doesn't make sense. Elastic is reversible, remember that. You can come back to your original position. Okay. Let's go ahead. We're moving on to waves now. The graph shows the variation with time of the displacement of a particle as a progressive wave passes. Where are the frequency and amplitude? So, amplitude is clearly 5 millimeter. Amplitude is clearly 5. And what about the frequency? The time the time period is 10 nanosecond. So frequency is 1 by 10 into 10 to the power minus 9. That gives us an answer of 1000000. Zero, 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 zero. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1 into 10 to the power 8. Get it? Hertz. So if you convert to mega, that's 1 into 10 power 8 into 10 power minus 6 megahertz, which is 1 into 10 power 2 or 100 hertz. So 21 is in fact A. Okay. Twenty two. The graph shows the variation of the displacement of an air particle with time as the sound wave passes through air. The intensity of the sound is halved while the frequency remains constant. Okay. The four graphs shown are drawn to the same scale. So basically it can't be A and B because the frequency is changed. It's between C and D. But now intensity is halved. You know that I is proportional to A square, right? So I1 by A1 square is equal to I2 by A2 square. But I2 is actually half of I1 by A2 square. Okay, now what? We want to find out A2. So A2 by A1 whole square I cross multiplied is equal to half I1 by I1. We can get rid of I1. 
so we end up with a2 by a1 whole square is equal to half so if you root over half root over 1 by 2 is actually root 2 by 2 or 0.7 so a2 by a1 is equal to 0.7 or a2 is 0.7 times a1 so we are going to look for 0.7 times the original we had four boxes 1 2 3 4 initially so 0.7 times 4 is 2.8 boxes i'm going to look for 2.8 boxes so 2.8 boxes this is exactly 2 this is 2.8 boxes right i'm going to go with d 22 is d interesting sum print 3 which statement is correct? Gases cannot transmit longitudinal waves. This is wrong. We need sound, right? Air is a gas. Air contains gas. It can tr transmit longitudinal waves. Longitudinal sound waves cannot form station waves. This is wrong. We form them in tubes. Solids can transmit, transmit both transverse and longitudinal waves. Transverse waves cannot pass through vacuum. D is wrong because electromagnetic waves can pass through vacuums. Solids can transverse, uh, sorry, transmit both transverse and longitudinal waves. So here's the thing. This is a bit tricky in a sense. What do you guys think? Basically, A, B, and D are wrong, right? But C is definitely correct. Why? If you put your ear on the table and you emit sound, it can, in fact, uh, you can hear the sound louder because the medium does help to transmit the sound, okay? On the other hand, uh, suppose gamma radiation. It's an electromagnetic wave transverse. It can pass through lead even, right? So solids can transmit transverse wave as well transverse waves as well so yeah 23 c is correct it can transmit both okay but the others are wrong cars traveling at constant velocity towards a man standing in the middle of the road the driver sounds the car's horn as a warning the horn emits a sound wave of constant frequency okay the emission is constant but the observer will hear something else when distance decreases what happens to the wavelength wavelength decreases and frequency increases the frequency of the sound heard by the man is different from the frequency of the sound emitted by the horn which is correct the frequency of the sound emitted by the horn is greater than the frequency of the sound heard by the man wrong the observed frequency okay the observed frequency the one heard by the man will be greater than the one emitted by the source. The frequency of the sound heard by the man depends on the distance between the car and the man. Uh, not really. It depends on the velocity, not the distance. All right. Next. The sound waves continually accelerate as they move from the horn to the man. The wavelength of the sound heard by the man is less than the wavelength of the sound emitted by the horn. Okay. So, observed frequency is greater, but the wavelength is actually less wavelength of the sound of the observed the wavelength of the observed sound is less than the wavelength of the uh, source do you guys understand because as you come closer frequency decreases the gaps between the wave the wave fronts actually decreases as it comes closer so d is correct and c doesn't make sense the sound waves do not continue to accelerate it's just that they're emitted at different distances which is why the distance between wave fronts decreases Basically, this is what happens. This is the car, right? It made one wave over here. Then it moves slightly to the right. Okay. Then it moves slightly to the right. And then it emits another wave. So what's happening? What's happening, basically? Like, if you think of it in a very short time span, this is what happens in actually. How do I show this in a picture? This is the original scenario, right? If, um, you know, it's stationary, but if it moves closer, what's going to happen is the ones over here, right, this wave, it's going to be squeezed over here, basically. This is what happens. Essentially, this is what happens when a car moves towards you. The, the, these wave fronts come closer together, okay? That's what happens. They don't accelerate. The speed is the same. Remember that. Okay, that's why C is wrong. 
25. Which statement about the electromagnetic waves is correct? The wave of wavelength 5 into 10 power minus 6 is invisible to the human eye. That is true. Now we can't see electromagnetic waves. So 5 into 10 power minus 6. That is exactly uh, 5 into 10 to the power minus 6. That is basically into 10 to the power 9. 5000 nanometers. Or basically 5 micrometers, you know, so we can't see uh, the electromagnetic waves, all right? They can be polarized. They can be. They, it's not cannot. They can all travel at different speeds. This is wrong. They all travel at the same speed. They consist of vibrating atoms. No, they don't. It doesn't need a medium to travel, okay? 26. A station wave is set up on a string that is stretched between two fixed ends that are 48 centimeters apart. At one instant, the appearance looks like this. Okay, it has three loops. What is the wavelength? All right. So the difference is 48 centimeter. Okay. So this is a node, 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 node. Node to node is lambda by 4. Sorry, node to node is lambda by 2. We have lambda by 2 again and lambda by 2 again. So 3 lambda by 2s. If they're added up, we're going to get 3 lambda by 2. So 3 lambda by 2 is equal to 48 centimeter. Lambda is equal to 48 times 2 by 3. 16 times 2 is 32. 26 is B, 32 centimeters. Very important. We don't have much left. A pipe closed at one end has a loudspeaker at the open end. For some frequencies of sound from the loudspeaker, a station wave is formed in the air within the pipe at the open end. So one closed end, one open end. So we basically have these patterns. These patterns are possible. Either we can get this one or we can get this one. Basically something like this and so on. So let's see for this one. Okay. The length is fixed at 0.85. So lambda by 4 is equal to 0.85. Okay. So lambda is equal to 4 times 0 0.85, which is 3.4. And you know that V is equal to F lambda, right? So 340, the speed is equal to 3.4 times F. So 340 divided by 3.4 is 100 hertz. So we will get 1 at 100 hertz, OK? Next, for this, this is actually uh, lambda by 2 here and lambda by 4 here. So that's, in total, 3 lambda by 4. 3 lambda by 4 is equal to 0 0.85. 0 0.85 times 4 by 3 is 1.13 or lambda equals to 17 by 15. 340 is equal to 17 by 15 times f. So 340 by answer gives us uh, this answer. We're getting 300. Okay. So do you guys get the trend? for like we missed 200 do you get it so it can't be the answer because it's only uh like odd multiples like you're gonna get f you're gonna get the patterns at f three times the natural frequency five times the natural frequency seven times the natural frequency and so on this is the pattern okay for one end closed and one end open but for two open ends it's different it occurs at everything, like 100, 200, 300, 400, etc. 28. Water waves of wavelength lambda are instead normally on an obstacle with a narrow gap. The width of the gap is equal to lambda. The waves from the gap emerge over an angle theta as shown. The gap is slowly widened. Which changes, if any, occur to lambda and to the wavelength of the emerging waves? Okay, so you guys need to understand that, like nothing happens to wavelength after diffraction nothing happens to wavelength wavelength actually remains the same so it's between c and d but what happened we have actually widened the gap if you widen gaps do you know what happens basically the wave will diffract less the waves become like this they diffract less for a narrow gap, diffraction is more. And for a wide gap, diffraction is less. Bending is less. So since bending is less, the angle 
of diffraction actually we say that it decreases so 28 is in fact a okay but if we decrease the gap it would increase 29 light of a single frequency passes through two narrow slits and produces an interference pattern on the screen some distance away so we are dealing with double slits right so x equals to lambda d by a the interference fringes are very close together what would increase the distance between the fringes x is equal to lambda d by a how could we increase x how increase the brightness uh, that wouldn't do anything right increase the distance between the slits and the screen if we increased d x would increase b is the correct answer uh, increase the distance between the two slits if you increase the denominator a x would decrease increase the frequency if you increase frequency lambda would decrease so that's a no-go 30 light of wavelength 5.4 into 10 power minus 7 is instead normally on a diffraction grading so we're gonna go for d sine theta is equal to n lambda the separation between adjacent lines in the grading is 2 into 10 to the power 6 meters. The light that emerges from the grading falls on a semicircular screen as shown in the view from above. Okay. How many bright dots are seen? Okay. So we want to find out the maximum number of lines. Okay. So we're going to go for, for maximum number of lines, it's sine 90. So D is 2 into 10 to the power minus 6 N times lambda 5.4 into 10 power minus 7. So the value of N is 2 into 10 power minus 6 divided by 5.4 into 10 to the power minus 7. Okay, so I'm getting a value of N is equal to 3.7. But you cannot round it off to the next integer. You need to take 3, the lower integer. Okay, so N is actually equal to 3. So n is equal to 3. So we're going to get 3 bright dots on each side. So how many are we getting in total? 3 here, 3 here, 1 here. So that is 7 in total. 30 is D. Next for 31. A straight copper wire of diameter 0.14 in 10 power minus 3 has a number density of free electrons of 8.5 in 10 power 28. In a given time interval, a charge of 0.15 moves through the wire. What is the average displacement of the free electrons on the wire in this time interval? Okay, so we need to find out velocity first. We know that I is equal to NAVQ, right? We have n and diameter, we can find out a, we know q. In a given time interval, okay. How do we solve this? Basically q is equal to it, i is equal to q by t, right? For a given time interval. Okay, so displacement is equal to velocity by time, right? Sorry, velocity is equal to displacement by time, s by t. Okay, so we want to find out the displacement. So displacement is basically velocity into time. Do you guys understand? So q is equal to it and i is equal to q by t, right? So i is equal to q by t is equal to n a v q. Okay, so they are asking us to find out the displacement, basically V times T. Q is equal to N A Q times V T. Okay, or Q by N A Q is equal to the displacement. That's how we do it, okay? So let's find this out. Q is actually um, 0.15. That's the capital Q is the charge passed through. N is the number density, 8.5 into 10 to the power 28. Area is basically pi d squared by 4, right? 
or you can go for pi r square it's up to you uh, you can find out the radius easily the radius is um, 0 0.21 into 10 power minus 3 so pi r square times pi wait let me move this here whoa So pi into 0 0.21 into 10 power minus 3. Pi r square. That's the area. Then what do we have? Q, the elementary charge, 1.60 into 10 to the power minus 19. So that's that. Let's multiply this. 8.5 into 10 to the power 28 times pi times 0 0.21 into 10 to the power minus 3 the whole square times 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19. So 0.15 divided by answer gives you a value of 7.96 into 10 to the power minus 5. This is the displacement. Logically, this is, should be it. So 7.96 into 10 to the power minus 5 is rounded off to uh, C over here, right? So 31 is in fact C. Let's finish this. 32. What is the definition of the potential difference across a component? So potential difference, remember, it's not V is equal to IR. It is actually defined as the work done per unit charge as it moves through one component or the energy converted from electrical to other forms at its as it, per unit charge as it passes through a component. Okay, so 32C is misleading product of current and V is equal to IR it's misleading the correct answer is energy per unit charge okay transfer to the component this is the answer right or you could say that it's the work done per unit charge as it passes through a component 33 so this is the characteristic for a semiconductor diode above a certain positive potential the diode obeys Ohm's law not really, no. It is not proportional since it does not pass through the origin. It's actually exponential. This is wrong. It needs to be pro uh, proportional. B. Current is directly proportional to the potential difference when the current in the diet is in one direction. No. It's not proportional. For proportional, it had to be like this. Okay? It is exponential. The diode has zero resistance when the current in the diode is in one direction. this is uh, wrong it has infinite resistance on one side on the left and on the other side we say that it doesn't have zero resistance but after a certain point resistance decreases substantially that's how we word it so c is also incorrect the best answer is d the resistance of the diode depends upon the potential difference across it true is it positive or negative right best answer 34 a wire has resistance 30 ohms. A second wire is made from the same material, has the same mass, and is three times as long. What is the resistance of the second wire? Okay. R is equal to rho L by A. Same mass, but three times as long. Okay. We know that density is equal to mass by volume, right? So same material, so same density. So density equals to mass by area into length. So this is for the original wire, okay? So for the original wire, A was equal to M divided by density times length. But now for the new wire, what happened actually? For the new wire, the mass remains the same, okay? The density remains the same since same material, but the length has increased by three times. So what happened to area compared to normal? MDL into 1 by 3. So it is actually the area is one third of the normal area. Okay. So there is one third of the normal area. So R is equal to rho L by A. So R is equal to same material rho times 3L thrice the length and one third of the area. If you do reciprocal properly, so it's actually rho L by A times 6. So 6 times the resistance of the original one. 6 times 30 is actually 180. Uh, 34, right? Did I mess up somewhere? Three, 
three times as long. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Mathematic error. Three times three is nine, right? So nine times two seven. Nine times thirty is two seventy. Okay, so it's D. Thirty-five. A cell has internal resistance R and electromotive force F E. The cell is contained in series with an ammeter and a variable resistor of resistance R. When R is ten, the ammeter is point three. When R is five, the ammeter is point four. Okay. So listen, E is equal to I R plus R basically. So E is equal to point three ten plus R and E is equal to point four five plus R. So from this one we get E is equal to three plus point three R, E is equal to two plus point four R. Okay, that's what we get. Now we want to find out E. So let's equate this first. 3 plus 0.3 R is equal to 2 plus 0.4 R or 0.1 R is equal to 1. R is basically 10, 10 ohms. So E is equal to 2 plus 0.4 times 10. So that's 4 plus 2 which is 6. So we're gonna go with 6. 35 is 6. D. Last 5. The sum of currents entering a junction is equal to the sum of currents leaving the junction. This is Kirchhoff, Kirchhoff's first law and it is as a consequence of the conservation of charge. Okay? And the second law is the conservation of energy. So A, the answer is A, 36A. 37. In the circuit shown, the temperature remains constant. Okay. In which circuit does the potential difference increase with increasing light intensity? So temperature remains constant. We are going to ignore uh, option A. So if you increase light intensity, resistance of the light dependent resistor actually decreases. So if resistance decreases, uh, according to potential divider, the voltage of this LDR will decrease. So B is wrong. What about C? If you increase light intensity, R decreases, V also decreases. Okay, this is wrong. If you increase light intensity, then the resistance decreases. The voltage of this LDR decreases, so the voltage of the thermistor must increase. 37D. Okay. 38. Carbon-14 decays to nitrogen-14 by emitting a beta-minus particle. Which statement explains why the beta-minus particles are emitted with a range of kinetic energies? Interesting. Basically, carbon-14 decays into nitrogen-14 and it releases a beta-minus particle and also it releases an electron antineutrino. So basically the energy that is released is actually shared between the energy is shared between the beta minus particle and the electron antineutrino. That's the actual reason. Okay. All three actually, that's the reason. You need to know this, okay? The energy is divided between them. That is why uh, it doesn't have fixed energy. Next, a nucleus of radioactive element emits an alpha particle, then a beta minus, and then another beta minus. What statement describes the final element? Okay, let's try it with, you know, this X. Suppose we start with, you know, 16, 8, for example. After emission of an alpha particle, uh, which is 4, 2, we ended up with Y, which has a mass of 12 and a proton number of 6. Okay, next what happened? Basically, Y, 12, 6, emitted a beta minus particle. That's 0, minus 1. So we ended up with Z maybe, which had mass number 13, sorry, mass number 12, which is conserved, and a proton number of 7. Okay, next, what happened? Z decayed by another beta minus particle. So Z, 12, 7, decayed by beta minus. So we end up with, you know, maybe another letter, letter like a P, which is 12, 8. So we end up with P, 12, 8. The mass number remains so wait it's not an isotope of the original element as proton number has changed or has it if we compare them this is our start this is our end so proton number actually remains the same okay proton number remains the same 
but the mass number has decreased substantially. So having the same proton number makes you an isotope of the original element. So C is correct, okay? So A and B are wrong because they're saying that they're different elements, but proton number de determines your identity. It is the same element as the original element, but with a different proton number. That doesn't make sense. Come on. D is wrong. So we're an isotope of the original element. Same proton number, different mass number. How many hadrons, baryons are there in a nucleus of beryllium-49? Okay, let's see. So four protons, five neutrons. Okay, so proton is up, up, down. Neutron is up, down, down. So this into four and this into five. So that's uh, four, two, U, D. And okay, so eight, U, four, D, five, U. 10d in total we have 13u 14d 13u 14d okay and also we have uh, four electrons okay oh wait they aren't we aren't talking about quarks here my bad so we were talking about hadrons baryons and mesons okay so basically um we need to know the family okay we need to know the family of particles understood so what is a hadron what is a baryon what is a meson so basically particles are classified in two ways basically there are leptons like electrons and there are hadrons hadrons are divided into mesons and baryons Baryons are composed of three quarks. Mesons are composed of two quarks, the quark and antiquark. So here we have zero mesons actually. We have none. But neutrons and protons, they are actually baryons. They are part of the hadron family. So we actually have, if you think about it, uh, nine nucleons or nine protons and neutrons combined so all nine of them are hadrons and we can also say that all nine of them are in fact baryons that's why the answer is c all right guys that's all for today i'm gonna link the paper for may june 2022 paper one two up here and the paper for may june 2022 paper one three down here and i'm gonna link the playlist for paper one up here and if you like the video remember to subscribe to the channel and hit the like button see you guys in the next one Bye.